So good morning to all of you. Thank you for coming this morning. It's so good to see you. So I was asked to speak uh, to you about the theme of what is, antipo- what is the relationship of anthroposophy to Waldorf education and, um, and some of the philosophical and historical background, why Rudolf Steiner formed the Waldorf School, how it came about. So let's start there, if we could. As you know, Rudolf Steiner was born in 1861, at the, in the middle of the 19th century, and he, uh, he was a deeply interested as a young boy in everything around him, and he was very, very perceptive. He actually had certain spiritual gifts, even as a young child. He could perceive things that other people could not perceive. In addition to the world of the senses, we know that some people are sensitive to the, to the more hidden aspects of reality. And Rudolf Steiner had, had qualities that he was a seer. And yet he found very few people that he could actually share his observations or have conversations with. Because as he began to speak to his parents about these things, they would kind of shush him up. We really don't talk about those things. So effectively, it took him a long time. It wasn't until he was about 18 years of age that he actually found someone with whom it was actually an herb gatherer, a man named Felix Kogutsky, a, a man who worked in, in, in uh, the, and the picking of herbs and, and preparing them for medicinal purposes, that he began to recognize that this person also had spiritual perception. And so Rudolf Steiner began to sidle up to this character and they had deep conversations. And Felix was also very aware of the loneliness one feels Without, spirit, without access to someone who can talk about the things that you're sharing, it's a very lonely, very lonely existence. So Rudolf Steiner had deep conversations with Felix, and Felix gradually said to him, you know, you are really, you have some wonderful capacities, and I would like to introduce you to my teacher, to my master. And so gradually, around the age of 21, we know that Rudolf Steiner then was met, met a, a, a very advanced spiritual teacher himself, and more or less, assisted Rudolf Steiner in sharpening up his faculties of perception. Now friends, just we could say the spiritual faculties of perception, Rudolf Steiner describes them, they're like an extended sense of, he- of seeing. So in, in addition to seeing the forms and outlines of the sense world, from what I understand from Rudolf Steiner's descriptions, I do not have these faculties, by the way, although all of us have them blatantly. All of us have a little bit of clairvoyance, a little bit of clairaudience a little bit of clairsentience. Nonetheless, as, as Rita Sander describes it, he says there's a heightened sense of seeing which can be called imagination. And, and a spiritual seer can see, in addition to the outlines and the colors that we see in, of the physical sense world, in addition to that, one begins to perceive other forms also participating in, in the world of the senses. So one begins to see that present within the sense world, there's also, there are other things to be seen than what we perceive only with our senses. In the same way, he says, the faculty called inspiration is a kind of spiritual hearing. Now many of us actually do have some experiences with these things. We'll see something out of the corner of our eye and we, and we don't, when we sharpen our, our visual focus, it may not be there, but we know we saw something. You know what I'm saying. So we have these little inklings that there's something, there's more going on than, than meets the eye. In the same way, there's more than going, going on in terms of what we can hear. Occasionally, we may feel that someone is almost whispering in our ear, you know, and we're, we're trying to find an address or we're trying, we're trying to locate something. And it's almost like somebody is whispering guidance, turn left and look up. Oh, there it is, you see. So again, where did that voice come from? and how did we perceive it, that's the faculty of inspiration. It's almost as though there are, there are spiritual beings, unseen beings, and we have an angel as well who, who helps guide us to things that we don't perceive directly with our senses. And this faculty is spiritual, it's kind of an extended sense of hearing. And he, Rudolf Steiner calls it inspiration. In addition to that, the ability to actually perceive uh, beings themselves in their totality, Rudolf Center calls the faculty of intuition. And it would be as though I were to reach over to Dan and I were actually were to touch his outline and I can perceive the form of this being and, and I know that Dan is there because I can perceive him, I could even touch him. So the faculty of intuition, an inward ability to touch 
uh, to touch the spiritual a spiritual being, to actually perceive the spiritual being as though they were present with you and you were shaking their hand or giving them a hug or, or perceiving them directly. So these three faculties, Rudolf Steiner tells us, all of us have these three faculties. But for the most part, these forces that, that are slumbering in us, the forces of imagination, inspiration, and intuition, the faculties which would allow us to see spiritual reality, to, to hear spiritual meaning, and to, and to actually begin to identify and be in touch with spiritual beings, those forces were the forces that were working in childhood in the early part of our life. And they all went to sleep around the age of 20 or 21 in us. And so what, what happens is those very forces, all of us have them because all of us have developed from beyond the age of 21. And yet he says they go to sleep around 20 to 21. In a certain sense you could say we grow to maturity at the age of 21. And it's almost as though these forces, they, 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 just, they just go latent in us. And so they're slumbering within us. He says it's almost like they've done their work. They've, they've done their job in the first seven years. They've done their job from seven to 14. They've done their work from 14 to 21. And then they kind of go to sleep. And they allow us, in a certain sense, to, to be independent of them. Now, friends, if we continually had a spiritual companion telling us what to do, we would be a little bit, I mean, you know, just like having anybody telling you what to do all the time, you begin to get annoyed, that, you know, go away, leave me alone, I, you know, I want to do my own thing. So this is very much a character of the spirit of the human being. We, we do feel, I want to be independent. I don't want somebody telling me what to do. And the spiritual world is more or less set it up for us that we can be rebels without a clue. <laughs> yeah, if you know the Tom, the, the, the Tom Petty song, "Rebel Without," a, so you know, rebels without a cause. So anyway, you know, it's like we, you know, we can be independent of the spiritual world, and the spiritual world can't really interfere with us, and that's the way we want it. You see, to a large degree, I want to do what I want to do. All of my three children, at one point in their life, or several points in their life, have said to me, "Dad, I want to do what I want to do," and when they say that, I say. I, I hear you. Okay, I, I got it. You see, so so when a child says that to you, you feel that that's the independence of the of the human spirit streaming through the the, the child, yeah. and that's that's something to be re respected and revered. We don't like to be interfered with. We want to do what we want to do, and so do our children. So the question then becomes, how do we use and how did Rudolf Steiner basically use the understanding of the development of the child? to draw out the curriculum and, and to be able to train and work with the forces that are active in shaping the child in the first seven years and from seven to 14 and 14 to 21. How did he use that understanding to develop the curriculum for the Walter School? Because that's what he did. Now friends, if, if someone were to say to you, what is the relationship between anthroposophy and Walter education? If you were to say, well, you know, Waldorf teachers have to believe in anthroposophy. That's not true, not true at all. However, it would be foolish for a person to try, to, this is, it would be foolish to me to try to get a, to get a position in repairing brakes at an auto repair shop if I didn't know anything about automobiles and brakes and how they, you know, and momentum and, you know. So I, I, would, I would need some training to be a technician in, a, in an auto, in an auto repair place, yeah. I would need to know something about the topic of which I'm, I'm trying to develop an expertise. So, so in the same way, we can begin to say that, that uh, anthroposophy, what the word means, anthropos is the upright human being. Yeah? It's a Greek word, anthropos, and it actually means the, up, the upright human being. <clears throat> and so, so the upright human being, if we notice, once we stand up, our hands are free. We're standing on the ground, the ground is firm beneath our feet, but our hands are free to explore and to touch and to be creative. And our head is high. And effectively, we begin to recognize that our head, in a certain sense, is, is an echo of the whole cosmos. It's almost as though the whole sphere of the heavens that we go out in the evening, we see the blue sky during the day, we see the night sky in the evening, our head more or less is, is an imitation of the dome of the heavens. And our limbs are very much developed out of the strength of living on the earth. And our, 
our, our chest, our rhythmic system, our heart and lung, is, is connected with breathing and the circulation of blood. Yeah? And I can't just breathe once, okay, I'm gonna take an, I'm gonna inhale and then I'll, and that'll be it for the day. You know, I'll inhale in the morning and I'll exhale when I go to bed. <laughs> nope, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. I have to inhale and exhale about 18 times a minute. And, and the wonderful thing is that my heart has a rhythmic relationship to my breathing. The heart, the heart beats about four times as fast as I breathe. Isn't that lovely? So this, this relationship of the rhythmic system, that there's, a, there's almost like a symphony sounding within our chest. If we actually were to meditate and were to tune into the, to the rhythm of our breathing and our, our, and our pulse, we, and this of course is a, a yogic technique, to, uh, to attune yourself to your breathing and the circulation of your blood, you begin to feel this incredible peacefulness and you begin to feel that in fact it's not just my little being here, I'm actually connected with the rhythms, the rhythms of the cosmos, you see? So we begin to feel that the human form itself is, is mirroring the cosmos, the dome of the heavens and the dome of the head, the rhythmic system in relationship to the, to the rising and setting of the sun and the moving of the planets and the changing of the seasons, and the limb system and the digestive system, the metabolic system, deeply connected with the mysteries of the earth. I need strength to stand up. I need, but I, you know, and I develop that strength. The child doesn't stand up first thing. Now friends, this is something else that, that we know. You know, if you were to go to Best Buy and buy a laptop or to buy a cell phone or to buy some device, and, and you'd never had that particular device before, usually there's a training manual. You know, there's an instruction manual that comes with the, with the device. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you go, so, and, and if it's not there, you, then you have to say, what do I do now? Now, friends, however, you, we birth children. And there's no training manual. Have you noticed? You know, when a child is born, there's no set of instructions as to what to do. And so how does the mother know what to do? How does the father learn what to do? So effectively, it used to be that we learned that you could say there was a healthy instinct. And we find, of course, in the animal kingdom as well, instinct of life, there's a tremendous wisdom in instinct. Mm -hmm. So the instinct of life has a certain wisdom to it. But Rita Center tells us that, that human beings, as we have progressed and evolved over the time of history, that the instinctive wisdom, the instinctive forces are, are, uh, are diminishing to some degree and what we need to do now is we need to consciously take hold. We need to learn consciously to do what we used to do out of instinct. That's the, that's the symptom of our time. And the fact that we, are, uh, that we don't know how to educate children, that we don't know, you know, basically we have to learn to do consciously what people used to do more or less kind of out of the rhythm, rhythmic connection with nature. We've lost that rhythmic connection with nature. We've lost those healthy instincts to a large degree. And now we need to learn consciously to do that. Now the advantage of this for the human being is that we are more free. Instincts can also guide us into, into certain behaviors that we're not particularly uh, interested in. Yeah? So we're f we become freer of instinct, but that means that we need then to take more conscious participation if we want to achieve something. So we could say that the arc of, of evolution has been from kind of coming out of the spiritual world, born as a child, deeply connected with nature, and, and the history of evolution of consciousness, as Rudolf Sander describes it. We, were, we used to be much more directly connected with the spiritual world. We were much more attuned to the, to the group souls of the animals and the plants and the minerals and the beings around us. Angels, archangels, and archives, spiritual beings were completely a part of our experience in the, in the distant past. In addition to that, we, we learn to forget that by being born into a body. And, you know, and we may have inklings when we, I, I know I've had the experience, you probably had the experience as well. You go somewhere and you've never been there in this life but you feel like you know this place. There's something familiar about a particular place. Maybe you're traveling and you go visit some site and you feel like this place feels so familiar. Why does it feel so familiar? I've never been here before. 
is that true? I've never been here before. Mm -hmm. So we need to begin to see that the spiritual world has also given us the gift of forgetfulness. We don't remember. We don't remember that we've been here before. That's to our benefit in terms of developing freedom. However, it also means that we've lost we've lost a sense of connectedness with our previous incarnations. So the idea of reincarnation is not something that a Walder teacher has to believe in, but, but anthroposophy, the science, the wisdom, this is, so I told you about anthropos. Anthropos is the upright human being, the head and heart and hands free, able to give direction out of itself to what it wishes to do. And Sophia is the word wisdom. Yeah, so, so, so anthropos, Sophia is the wisdom of becoming a human being. It's, it's in a certain sense our attempt to try to connect with the instruction manual that didn't arrive when we were born, you know, effectively. So, so one can begin to say that if we, if we take an interest in the spiritual world, if we ask questions, somehow the answers begin to appear for us. We ask the questions, and when we meet someone, we begin to feel I feel this person feels completely so familiar to me. And we meet some people and we have a deep feeling of fear or distrust of them, hmm. almost instinctively, and we don't know why, you see? And the person is, has not done anything harmful to us, you know, we've just met this person. Why do we feel a certain sympathy and acceptance of certain people and a certain fear or desire to withdraw from others? Could it be, yeah? that we have forgotten our relationships with those other individuals from our previous lives. That perhaps the people with whom we have an affinity are people that we had a comfortable relationship with in our previous incarnations, and the people that we have a certain discomfort with may be people, we're, maybe that we're here to meet them again, to learn to understand them, and for them to understand us, so we can heal the fear and the distrust that we may have of them. You know what I'm saying? So in other words, we begin to feel that there is a guidance, that the human being is guided from life to life, that, we, that just as we progress from, uh, in our age, from, from, from a, young, a baby to a toddler to, you know, to a, a school, an early school child, to a middle school child, to a high school, to an adult, we could say that we also progress, and we progress from first grade to second grade to third grade, we progress through a series of lifetimes, and in between those lifetimes, we go back to the spiritual world to share the experiences that we've gained by living in a body, and to, and to have the experiences that we have developed, that we have had in our previous lives. Those are transformed into new talents and new capacities. This is what Ruta Steiner tells us. Now, Ruta Steiner, this is not a theory for Ruta Steiner. It's a theory for me. Yeah. It's, it's, something that it's, it's something which I can begin, however, initially it sounds kind of strange. You know? In Anthroposophy, if the first time you encounter it, it says, you know, it, it, it reveals things that are beyond our immediate experience, and yet they begin to feel more and more familiar. So I know that certain ideas that initially might have sounded kind of crazy, I now accept them as, as given facts. And it's not that I've learned, to, it's not that I brainwashed myself, it's rather that I've tested them over time and I begin to feel much more comfortable with those ideas. Even though I cannot perceive my previous incarnations, I certainly can begin to entertain the idea of previous lives. And my experiences in traveling and meeting people confirms the fact that we've been here before. This is not our first, we're not in first grade, friends. This is not our first incarnation. We've been here before. Now, with that knowledge, you could say, if, if a child is trailing clouds of glory, you know, this is a beautiful picture, that you know, the child is not born in utter nakedness and utter innocence, but a child enters into the body as a baby trailing clouds of glory. Who was this child in their previous life? The child just has left the spiritual world and is coming into a body. If we have that sense of the baby, that sense of the child, you know, you, we, we prepare, you know, the pregnancy takes, takes time, but we have a little bit of time to prepare and maybe to set up a room and a crib and, you know, to get blankets and, and certain things that we think we'll need when the baby is born. But once the baby is actually there, don't you feel that there's, 
it's not just one tiny, how could one tiny little baby completely rearrange every aspect of your life? Because that's what happens, isn't it? As parents, isn't it? You know, how could a tiny little baby completely rearrange the whole rhythm and the whole sense of everything that's going on? It's magical, you see? Because you begin to feel that the baby is a magnificent being. The body is small, it needs tending. But the spirit is huge, you see? The spirit fills, the spirit of the child fills the whole house. And, and we begin to concern ourselves with an additional being in our, in our household. And, and the needs of that child are, are strong. And the child lets us know that it has needs and we better take care of it, you see. So, but we also feel that in addition to just the, the presence of the child, when you go into the, into the baby's room and the baby is sleeping, you begin to feel that there are other beings there. It's almost like you feel there's a whole host of, of angels in the room. And, and that the child, you know, while the child is breathing and digesting and sleeping you be, and growing from day to day, you begin to feel that you're not alone. This child is accompanied by lots of friends. <coughs> there, are, there are beings there helping tend to the child as well. So we have our responsibilities as parents, but the spiritual world also feels a deep responsibility because they're trying to help a human being enter into a body and begin to stand up. And so friends, what, what, you know, if we look at the stages of childhood, we begin to get a sense of this, of this process. And Rudolf Steiner, again, Rudolf Steiner had these faculties of seeing and hearing and being in touch. He developed them to a very high degree. And so what anthroposophy is, Rudolf Steiner says natural science is a beautiful thing. Natural science depends on our senses so we observe things with our senses, natural science. Observation and thinking are the basis of all of our understanding. So natural science, you know, we, we start out with using our senses. Now we've learned to invent machines or, or <coughs> devices that will extend telescopes and, 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 and then, uh, you know, electronic devices and so forth. So we've extended our capacity to sense through the use of machines and through the use of technology. But we're still basically operating through what we can observe and what we can think. Now, if observation and thinking didn't bring us insight, we would just be spitting in the wind. We would be wasting our time. The beautiful thing is when we observe something and we begin to think about it, we begin to find ideas that actually seem to be operating in the thing that we're observing. That's the whole purpose of science, yeah? The purpose of science is something appears to us that we perceive, and then we say, what is this? How does it work? And by asking those questions, by thinking about it, the part that isn't perceptible to the senses begins to be perceptible to our thinking. When we think accurately about what we observe, then we say, I begin to know something. See, So knowledge arises through observation and thinking. And natural science starts with sense observation and thinks about what the senses provide with us. And that's, Rudolf Steiner praises natural science to the hilt. He says, the modern scientific technique is absolutely a wonderful thing. He says, however, because it's limiting itself to sense observation, it's missing something as well. So the, so the scientific approach is exactly what we need at, at this period of our history to become independent. But if we really under, want to understand the child, if we're only looking at the form of the body, we will not understand why the child is crying. We won't understand why the child is laughing. We won't understand proper nourishment. We won't understand, so in other words, what we don't get by observing merely with our senses, we don't understand the nature of the child's thinking or the child's feeling or the child's power of will. Natural science has come up with theories, but they're basically abstractions. Rudolf Steiner says, if you really ask a scientist what is the nature of thinking and how is thinking related to feeling and how is feeling related to the will, there are abstract theories. He says, but basically there's no real perception of the nature of thinking or the nature of feeling or the nature of the will. And yet, friends, every one of us all day long, these are the, these are the unseen forces that are working in our daily life. We wake up and immediately we observe the world and we think about what time is it? Is it time to get up? And do I need to, do I need to go to the restroom? 
you know, do I need to brush my teeth and get ready? You know, so we're, we're already, as soon as we wake up into the world of the senses, we don't ask the question, where was I all night? Yeah. Where were you last night? I mean, that, you know, that's an interesting question. You know, where were you last night? Yeah. So, so we, you know, we left another state of, of consciousness where we, we don't bring that consciousness when we wake up. But we might get, we might have had dreams. We might have had, we might have gone to sleep with a problem and we wake up with, with the answer and we say, how did that happen, you know? Last night I was, I was wrestling with this question. When I woke up this morning, the answer was there. For me, it comes in the shower, friends. To me, my shower is my, is my I don't know if it works for you, but I go into the shower, I take a shower in the morning, and that's where all the kind of the cobwebs, and, and you could say, I begin to get the ideas of the day in the shower. This morning was great, believe me. So, so, but anyway, showers, you know, it doesn't have to be a long shower, but I find the presence of water assist me in, in kind of you know, getting, putting things together. And I really do feel there's a blessing when water and air and warmth are coming together and you're, you're immersed in that experience so, and the soul opens up and the questions begin to arise. Anyway, we each have our own, our own favorite way of receiving insights. But nonetheless, you begin to feel there's, there can be an order to the day and I can link what I'm going to do today with what I did yesterday, you see? Because we could say the things the things that we did not do yesterday are impinging on us today. I have a long list of emails that need to be answered, you know. I have a long list of requests that I haven't yet responded to. And they weigh upon me. They weigh upon me. And I feel burdened by them. And I want to get, I want to take care of them because I want to satisfy the people who are asking requests of me. <clears throat> but I also realize that, that what I have to do today is related <clears throat> excuse me, to what I did not accomplish yesterday. Now, could it be, friends, that just as yesterday is just as far away from me as today is, as my previous life is far away from this life? Do we get, in other words, I can begin to say that today I have to deal with things that I didn't finish yesterday. Could it be that in this life, I'm trying to pick up the threads of what I didn't accomplish and also deal with the outcome of what I did in my previous life. Could it be, you see? So again, Rita Center says, there is this well-known saying, sleep is the younger brother of death. You know? And we shouldn't take that as, as something scary, no. But when we sleep, we become oblivious, you know, so far as the day's events go. When I go to sleep, I am not conscious in that state of sleep of, rem of remembering everything. And then And the next day, yeah, unless I had the power to reconnect with the previous experiences, I would be completely oblivious. Yeah. So in the same way, when I, when I die, I enter into another consciousness. I go into a longer state of sleep if in, in the spiritual world, and then I'm reborn in, an, in a later incarnation. But, I, but in a certain sense, just as yesterday and today are related, my previous life and this life, and the question then becomes, what are my tasks now and what I will do today? How, how will I be able to transform the things that I have yet to do from previous day into what I will take hold of now? What will be the outcome in my next life? What will be, if I, do, if I take care of these things today, what will I do with the rest of the day? And my father was very good at that. My father said, the way he, and my father was a very, very wonderful businessman. He only lived to be 54 years old. He had cancer. It was a tragedy, but he was a brilliant man. And he, what he said, well, he says, every day I go to the office, I make a list of things I have to do, and I take care of them first thing. I make a long list, and I take care of every one of them. The rest of the day is mine. You see? Wow. You know, if I were only that organized, my father was much better at it than I was. I put things off, you know. So, and then at 1130 at night, I'm trying to answer the emails that I should have done. So anyway, so, so we, it depends on how organized we are. But nonetheless, if we could organize our life, the life is really a gift. You know, we, what we do now is also set, we're setting something in place that will blossom in the future. We're planting seeds through our thinking and feeling and willing to today that will bear fruit in our in tomorrow and in our next life. So if we begin to understand that this is the way we operate as adults, 
when a child is born and the child is coming fresh out of the spiritual world, trailing clouds of glory, how do we know what to do? How do we know how to, wh how do we educate the child? How do we nourish the child? What does the child need? Now the child will let us know much of what it needs when it's, it's thirsty or hungry, it tells us, you know. So the child gives us certain, certain indications. But in a certain sense, educating a child is a very special, a very special process. And Rudolf Steiner had remarked that education, because we've lost our instincts, our instinctive, the healthy instincts to, to raise a child, now we need consciously to think about how to raise a child and how to work with these forces that are bringing the child into uprightness, that are allowing. So friends, and he, and he says, actually, we begin to see the stages. In the first year of life, between birth and the first birthday, the big accomplishment of the ch what is the big accomplishment of the child? What's the first thing the child does in the first year of life? He walks. We walk, yes. So the child begins to walk. The child achieves uprightness. The child becomes upright and begins to walk. Yeah. <clears throat> so the child learns to walk in the first year of life. Now walking requires strength in the limbs, but it also requires balance and it requires flexibility and adjustability. So that's a huge, a huge accomplishment, friends. And when you see a child, you know, the child will, will gradually work its way. Why does a child, why does a child want to come into uprightness? So we do. That's right. The child sees other human beings, sees other human forms that are upright, and the child works out of imitation. Now, we need to ask the question, why? Because this is also something we begin to see. Rudolf Steiner tells us that if we look at the stages of child development, between birth and seven years of age, the child is working primarily out of the forces of imitation, the urge to imitate. The urge for imitation, imitation, is that right? The urge to imitate, the urge to emulate, the urge to, to repeat or to copy or to, or to replicate the movements and the attitudes, the feelings and the thoughts and the actions of, of beings around it, that's the natural state of the child for the first seven years. And and Rudolf Steiner says, now this is actually, this is a wonderful thing to understand. We could say, why does a child imitate? Why does a child come in? The first thing the child does, you know, if you smile at a baby, the baby will smile back at you. If you frown, the baby will frown, you know. It's very interesting. And if you do something, the child will, will watch you and the child will try to repeat that action. You know what I'm saying? So the very young child, and even up to the age of seven, the child is basically a sense, Rita Stenner says, the child is a sense organ and receiving impressions of how human beings operate, the child will strive to, to replicate those actions and those feelings and those thoughts. For that reason, we have to be very careful as adults and as teachers what thoughts we have when we're in the, in the realm of, and when we're in the presence of a child, what feelings we're harboring because the child will mirror them, and what actions we're performing. So, because the child will take those on. Now, Rudolf Steiner tells the story several times. He says, when, he says I, had, I had the experience of, of a parent who came to me and said, I have a terrible problem. My five-year-old son is a thief. <laughs> and Rudolf Steiner said, tell me what he did. He says, well, the five-year-old went, went into the place where the money is kept, and took money out of the out of the little <clears throat> shoebox, and, and took money and bought bought candy and gave the candy to his friends. The child is a thief. <laughs> and Rudolf Steiner said, "Well, he says, uh, so the child is five. Yeah, the, the, is this where your wife keeps the money? Yes, this is where you. And your child has watched your wife open open that little box every day and take money and go and buy his food, right?" So all the child is doing, the child is not a thief, the child is just doing what the mother does. The child sees the mother go in and open the box and take money out and, and buy things for others and gives it away. That's exactly what the child did. The child was just replicating what, you, what the mother was doing, you see? 
So the child's not a thief at all. The child is just copying what the child has seen. There's no ill intent there. So again, we need to understand that a child in the first seven years is mirroring something in its environment. Mm. And therefore, if we, if we don't understand that, we're likely to kind of, you know, to, to say things or to do things, to reprimand or to correct or to give directions to the child that really have little meaning to the child. In fact, the child is confused by them. You know, so the child, what, what we do is what the child does. And if once we understand that, then we begin to clean up our act and we begin to say, maybe if a child is, is saying something not nice to somebody, maybe I better be careful who I'm saying when I'm around the child because the child is just copying what I'm doing. You see what I'm saying? So we begin to realize that the problem is not with the child. Now the question, friends, is why does a child imitate? And this is a wonderful question. And he be, Rita Sander tells us that when we go into the spiritual world, you know, well, when we go into the spiritual world, uh, we find that, of course, we don't have a body anymore. And nor do we have the gift of language. What language do angels speak? Is it German? Is it English? Is it Japanese? Is it, you know? What, what language do, do angels, they don't speak language the same way we do. Therefore, so he says, what we learn in the spiritual world is that if we want to commune with a being, even though we don't have a body, the, the being has a particular gesture to it. Each, each being has a gesture. <coughs> we think, for example, of the archangel Michael, and, and Mike, Rita Steiner speaks about the archangel Michael, Michael, he, he describes Michael as a victorious spirit, yeah? a powerful flaming being who is full of courage and goodwill and strength and light. Yeah? So if we want to take on, we, if we emulate that gesture within our own spirit being, we can then approach the Archangel Michael uh, in the spiritual world. That is, we take on the gesture. So, for example, if I were, if I were in, our, in the physical world, if I, if I wanted to come in with Dan, I would have to take on the, the gesture that Dan has his right leg crossed over his left and his hands folded very nicely. And, and so, so if I took on this gesture in the spiritual world, I could then approach Dan and we could have a conversation. And then if I wanted to approach you, I would change the gesture and I would, I would do this, you know, and I would, I would try to take on your gesture and then we could have a conversation. So in the spiritual world, even though we don't have a body, we take on the gesture of the other being and we learn that that allows us to approach that being and have communion with it. You understand what I'm saying? So by taking on the gesture of another, and our friends, we even do this socially. If you'll notice, if you're in a room with somebody and they cross their legs, if you're in sympathy with them, you'll cross your legs too, you know? And you say, why did I do that? I don't really want to cross my legs. Well, I did it because, you know, because I'm in sympathy with this other person. So, this, the, so friends, we, we enter, so we have spent several hundred years, perhaps, in the spiritual world doing, approaching other beings by taking on their gesture. We continue that in the first seven to nine years of life. We continue that tendency to imitate out of our spiritual experiences. We take on the gesture and the posture of other beings. You see what I'm saying? Now, once we understand that, we, we then begin to realize that the child is mirroring its environment. The child is mirroring the beings around us, and therefore moral, moral judgments <coughs> need to be placed not in the responsibility of the child, but in the responsibility of those around the child, because the child is, is doing what others are doing. You see what I'm saying? Now, understanding that gives us a whole new understanding of the child. So the first, first, first thing we do is we stand up and we walk. What do we do between, once we begin to walk, what begins to happen? Between the first year and the second year of life, what faculties does the child develop? So we begin to speak, yeah, talking. So, so between the first birthday and the second birthday, the child begins to speak. Yeah. And what language do we speak? What's around us? What ears? What's around us? And who's speaking to us the most? Our mother, you see? So we speak our mother tongue. Isn't that beautiful? Our mother tongue. 
what the mother, now the mother's wisdom is to speak to the child already before they're born, to speak to the child in the womb. Any of you do that? Yeah? You begin to say things to your child while the child is still in the womb. You say, well, the child doesn't really understand you. Why? What do you but, but you see, that's a, that's a completely abstract idea that the child doesn't understand. The child understands very well. It's just the child will learn the language. So we begin to speak, and we speak the mother tongue out of the wisdom of the fact that the mother is the one trying to communicate with the child. So the child will imitate and learn from the mother's speech how to speak. And then, but usually the child's speech starts off by being imitative. The child, you say something and the child will, will strive to, to repeat it. But gradually, between around the age from two to three, the child begins to assemble words in ways that it has not heard before. And we begin to realize, in addition to the child replicating sounds, the child begins to think. Yeah? Now, the child is not thinking <coughs> in an abstract way, but the child is beginning to put ideas together out of itself. This is a whole new stage of development. Yeah? And then, around the age of three plus, the child begins to refer to itself, it takes hold of itself, and begins to identify itself as I. The child begins to become self-aware more and more. So friends, these are archetypal stages of child development. It happens in every culture. It happens in every... These are, these are the natural stages of child development. Understanding this, we begin to feel... Now, we could say the strength to stand up and walk depends upon our forces of will. Would you agree? So we could say the child expresses itself through its will in the first, in the first few years of life, in the first year of life. Of course, the will will continue. The child's will will be there throughout its life. But the willing is particularly, well, is particularly asserting itself when the child asserts its, its standing up. And then we could say, we learn to begin in speaking. We speak out of the, out of the rhythmic system, and we speak out of, the, out of the feeling nature. So we begin to say that the child's feelings begin to develop and express themselves more strongly between the first year and the second year. In addition to the forces of will, the child begins to speak. And there's a feeling nature uh, <coughs> there. It's not just sounds. The child begins to communicate out of its feeling life. And then as the child begins to think, <coughs> the thinking begins to appear in the life of the child when we begin to discover that the child is assembling thoughts that it has not heard before. And the child is actually coming up with original ideas. It's assembling words and ideas in its own nature. Remarkable. Absolutely incredible. Yeah? And now, <coughs> when the child takes hold of itself, the child becomes self-conscious. We could say self-consciousness. The child really becomes aware of itself. It takes hold of itself. And once it, is, it has identified itself as a self, it, you, could, you begin to feel it is now referring to itself in the first person. It's speaking to itself as a being. And it's naming itself. But the interesting thing is, friends, we all have the same name. You know, the child may have referred to itself as Johnny or Sarah up until about the age of three. But the child, of course, partly by imitation, initially, the child notices that people refer to themselves as I, and the child will begin to use that name for itself as well. But when the child says it, you know, if I say, I want something, I'm not addressing Dan. I'm not addressing anybody else. When I say I, the person who is speaking is referring to itself. Self-referencing is something that, that happens in self-consciousness. So, but every one of us has the same name. We all refer to ourselves as I. So if I say, I want this, and Dan says, I want that, I says, no, I don't. <laughs> but Dan says, yes, I do, you see? So then we begin to have a conversation, and then we begin to realize that, that I have a sense of self, and Dan has a sense of self. But why do we have the same name? Is, is, is it just a matter of convenience? Or is there something deeper there? Again, 
is there, is there a spiritual being who kindles our sense of self? Ruta Steiner has an answer for that, yes? So, yes, there is. So we begin to feel friends. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to put something up here that may surprise you, but Ruta Steiner says that in our, th in our thinking life, our capacity to think, on the one hand, is a result of the fact that we lived in the spiritual world before we were born. The activity of thinking is a kind of a heritage that we bring with us out of our spiritual experiences. The fact that we can think is because we lived in the spiritual world before we were born. The, the activity that was going on in the spiritual world becomes our capacity to think. Now that seems initially like a strange <coughs> idea, but it's not so strange when we begin to realize that in our thinking, the angel, we have, every child has an angel, every, every adult has an angel. Do any of you have pets? Cats, dogs, hamsters, goldfish, yeah. So what, what do you feel is your responsibility to your pet? Feed it. Feed it, and what else? Yeah. Give it shelter. <laughs> yes, yeah. Give it comfort and give it, give it a home. And we, feel, and we feel responsible to the pet, yeah? Now friends, could it be that there's a spiritual being who's been given a pet and it's the human being, you know, in other words, we could say, there is an angel who's given a pet to take care of, and the pet is the human being. So when I begin to say I as a self, I'm now referring to myself as a human being. But a human being, the activity of thinking, is living within me, but that activity of thinking is actually the continued activity of the angel. The angel is active in my thinking. I can think because an angel is pouring its forces through my soul, allowing me to say these words and to place one word in relationship to another, hopefully in a way that you also can, can think along with me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we begin to see that the angel, when I read a sentence, says, and this was known even in the ninth century, there was a man named John Scotus Oregana in the ninth century who said, when I think an angel thinks in me. He had the, the perception of it. When I think, an angel is thinking in me. Now friends, so we could begin to say, here we are, we're a group of people. Imagine that, Rita Center even gives us a picture, he says, imagine that behind every one of us there's an angel, and the angel has, is standing above me with its hands on my head. My capacity to think is the gift that this angel is giving me. And the angel feels responsible to me because until I take full responsibility for myself, the angel has to feed me and give me comfort and give me and take care of me. So I'm the pet of the angel, if you will. And once, uh, once I establish myself as a, as a complete human being and become strong enough, the angel will then say, you, you, you've got it, <clears throat> go, go and flourish, you know, <clears throat> go live long and prosper, the, and the angel can step back and say, free at last, I don't have to take care of this human being anymore. But Ruth Steiner tells us that the angel actually is assigned to us, and we've had the same angel for many, many incarnations. Very interesting picture. Yeah. So the angel knows who we have been in our previous life, the angel gives us the power to think, and the angel is trying to help us become aware of ourselves as an individual. Now that's a very important thing to know if you're working with children. Because that means that if you're having a difficulty with a child, that you can speak not only to the child, but even more so, you can speak to the being who's closest to the child, in addition to the mother and the father, and that's the child's angel. Now it may seem a little strange to think that the child has an angel, but it shouldn't feel so strange to us because we begin to feel that there's, 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 there's a spiritual reality there. The guardian angel, the spirit, the spirit who is guarding and protecting the child, is always there. We can speak to the child's angel. And, and in fact, that's what Waldorf teachers are taught to do. They're said, they are taught to understand that each child has an angel, and that you can have conversations with the angel. And if the child's acting up in class, if you have a conversation with the child's angel, you'll begin to see that the child will, 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 will change that behavior. Yeah? And it's not manipulative, but it's rather, it's one of, of communing with the angel. We can work with the angel and the angel will work with us to try to assist the child to become human. In the same way we feel 
So if every one of us has an angel above us, more or less with the imagination, Britta Steiner gave the imagination, imagine behind you and above you is an angel with the, hands on, the angel's hands placed upon your head, that then there is an archangel. So where there's a group where two human beings or more are, are together, where two, two human beings are there, suppose I want to go have coffee with a friend. So I'll, I'll show up, me and my angel will show up at, at Starbucks, and my friend and their angel will show up. But now because there's two angels present, there's a being who arcs between the angels, and that's the archangel, you see? So where two human beings are present, there's two angels present, I think I'm just going out to coffee with my friend. There's actually five beings there, you see? There's me and my angel, there's my friend and my friend's angel, and there's an archangel who's present in the conversation, and the archangel lives in the feelings that I have for the friend, and the, and the feeling that, of the relationship. So the archangel, uh, the archangel lives in our feelings for one another. And the archangels allow us to, to commune and to, and to speak to one another and to feel communion with each other. And now, a little bit, a, a slightly greater scale, one can say. So we have, so archangels are also called folk souls or group souls, and they're the spirits of language. They're the spirits who live in our feeling for each other. And we know that if, if you hear different languages spoken, one gets a different feeling for the quality of the genius of each language. You know what I'm saying? So, so the archangel lives in our feeling life. Our relationships to each other are, are the relationships that our angels have. <coughs> in relation. So we have human beings in relationship to, other, to angels, and the archangel is the feeling that we have in communion with the other. Now, in addition to that, Rudolf Sena says there is a being who actually is helping us guide the direction of our will. But because we are living in a different time than we lived in our previous incarnations, Rudolf Sena says before the time of the Renaissance, the constitution of the human being was very different than it is now. And he says basically there was a period of history from, from about the 8th century before Christ to about the 15th century after Christ with the Renaissance, we know that as the Greco-Roman medieval period, Middle Ages, yeah? And Greece was the leading culture, and then Rome took over Greece, and then the medieval culture more or less flourished out of what Greece and Rome had given to the world for about 2,000 years. So that period of history was ruled over by a spirit of time, and when we speak of the spirit of the time, we usually think of that as an abstract idea. You know, the, the, time, the times they are changing there. But we do feel that there is a spirit who's trying to help us recognize that what we need to do now is different than what we needed to do in the 2,000 years preceding the time that began with the Renaissance. And Rita Sennett says the instinct of life was much healthier in that previous time one could, one could educate out of the instinct much more directly. But in our present time, since the time of the Renaissance, we need to develop more freedom, and therefore the instinct of life is withdrawn, and we need to, we need to develop more clear consciousness about why, why we're doing what we're doing. So we live in a new age of freedom, but the spirit who is responsible for cultivating that, that consciousness is, is called the time spirit. And that's the spirit called the archai. That's the spirit of time. Now, I've given names to three different levels of beings that we don't perceive directly in physical form. But these beings are very much present and they're very much active in our culture. And Rudolf Steiner's gift to, to part of his gift of anthroposophy to all of education is by saying by recognizing that we cannot continue to educate the way, a, 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 the way the children were educated in the Greco-Roman period or the medieval period, we need a new form of education. We're in a different time period. We're in the age of the consciousness soul. We can't just continue to educate the way that we've been doing for the 2,000 years prior to the Renaissance. We need a new form of education. In fact, he says, the tragedy of World War I was that there was no imagination. There was no flexibility in the thinking, feeling, and willing. 
human beings were, st were still being educated out of an old tradition that was no longer appropriate to their time. And we see if we actually follow this, what, what happened in World War I, there were certain alliances and promises that were made that were completely inflexible and it was almost like the collapse of a house of cards. Everything was inevitable and no one seemed to have the power to change anything. It was just a, it was a series of tragedies. And Rita Sinha says it, it showed the lack of flexibility and the lack of human understanding, World War I. Now World War II <laughs> continued to that, that impulse and we begin to feel, are we ever going to learn? And he says really one of the fundamental problems is we don't understand our fellow human being, we don't have our right relationship to each other, we don't understand our own individuality, we don't understand our relationship with others, we don't understand the opportunity that we have in the time in which we're living. We live in a very different time. If we can educate the child in a way that will meet the needs of the time, then the child will be, begin to participate creatively and do things that, that we've not been able to achieve before. So the time spirit, the archai, is, is there's a new spirit of the time and we need to understand the possibilities so that we can go from second to third to fourth to fifth to sixth grade, that we can evolve in our own, in our own culture as well. So Ruta Steiner developed something based on the idea of the willing and the feeling and the thinking. And he says basically we need to reorganize the whole world. He called it the threefold social organism. And it came out of a series of questions in 1917. People were very aware in Europe that Ruta Steiner was a, was a tremendous leader, that he had spiritual perception. They said to Ruta Steiner, we see Europe being completely crushed between Russia and, and, the, and the West. We see that Europe is the cultures of the West, the cultures of Russia and, and, and the economic pressures and, and, and military pressures are going to crush Europe. And, and of course that was absolutely correct. And he said, and so the question came to Rita Steiner, is there a way we can begin to, to, re, to review and reorganize our understanding of the world so that we can actually begin to participate properly in our time? And Rita Steiner said, let's work together. So he came up with the basic idea, friends, in our economic life, in the life, of, the life of producing goods and exchanging goods and receiving money, raising food, you know, raising vegetables, raising animals, and taking care of the animals and the plants, it takes labor, yes? But, but then one can say, but, but if I can do something, if I can use my will to serve the, and, and the, what I produce out of my own activity, I use it to serve my fellow human being. In exchange, they'll give me goods or money so that I can buy the things that I need. So in other words, the spirit of the economic realm is really the spirit of brotherhood. I do what I do in order to provide services and goods to somebody that I can exchange with the goods and services of somebody who's doing something that I need. So brotherhood is actually the proper attitude to have an economic sphere. We, we think that the profit, Rudolf Center even says, when, he says actually the exchange of money, when we think that we're, we're only working for wages, it diminishes us as human beings. We're not just working to get paid, you know. We're working because we're serving our fellow human being. We're doing something productive and, and we're receiving the productive activity of another human being. We need to value that much more than just the wage. You know? we need to realize that there's actually a, a spiritual exchange going on. And that will renew our sense of the economic life. We'll begin to work in associations, understanding and working cooperatively to balance the needs and the, and the, the products of what we're doing. In the, in, the, in the political sphere, so we could say brotherhood is the proper attitude in the realm of the will. In the, in the sphere of the feeling life, he says, the feeling of, of justice is strong in us. We need to cultivate that. So, but we need to cultivate that by recognizing the sense of equality. Yeah? That every human being has an equal right. Now friends, this is a big question today. Many people are realizing that certain attitudes have, have really blocked us from understanding how that certain people are treated in one way and other people are treated differently because of, of their gender, because of their orientation, because of their religious beliefs, because of their, of their race, there is tremendous inequity. 
in our time. That's one of the big problems. It's a big social problem. We need to recognize the equality of every human being in every situation. And rather than, than withholding or, or punishing, we need to have a sense of the equality and, and the diversity that every human being brings into, into life. That's, so that the spirit of equality needs to reign in the political and rights sphere. And these are big issues today as well as the economics here. You know, he says in the realm of thinking, that just as we have the capacity to think and to be creative and to get new ideas, in the spiritual cultural sphere, freedom is really the key. So he says in the practice of science, art, and religion, that they all actually are membered into the, into the uh, spiritual cultural sphere. So the right to to practice a religion according to whatever you think is, is proper. You should be, every human being has the freedom to, to practice their own belief. Every human being should have the, the freedom to, to, to do their artistic work. Every human being should have freedom to study and to explore everything that they want to explore. So in the spiritual cultural sphere of freedom. So friends, these old models that, that really nobody understood, freedom, equality, and fraternity or brotherhood they actually belong very much, just as they belong to the nature of thinking, feeling, and willing. They can belong, we can create a culture, a world culture, out of the spirit of brotherhood in the economic sphere, out of the sphere of equality in the political and rights sphere, and out of the sphere of freedom in the cultural, uh, spiritual sphere. And if we do so, we will not come into conflict with each other. We'll actually begin to celebrate and and work creatively as, a, as just as a human being participates as a head and a chest and a limbs, the whole social organism could begin to become healthy. And we'd find that these prejudices and these tremendous problems that we're having would begin to be solved. So this was the hope of 1917, 1918, 1919. And it was out of the spirit that Ritter Steiner was asked. And because Ritter Steiner had pointed out, he says, that culture, that threefold social organism will only come about if we begin to, to, to find the proper way to educate the child. So uh, there, was, there was a tremendous enthusiasm by, for many people in Europe, but gradually you could say human beings weren't quite up to it at the time. So gradually the ideas of the threefold social organism began to fade. It, 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 it didn't seem possible because it's hard to, to turn the, the current of history around, but it still is something to aspire to. But what was left was really what Rudolf Steiner gave as to the uh, to Emil Mold, who was the head of the of the Waldorf Astoria cigarette factory. Emil Mold had been a pupil of Rudolf Steiner for many years, and he was a cultural leader. And so he he was given permission to start a school for the children of his workers in the cigarette factory, and 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 Rudolf Steiner and he asked Rudolf Steiner, would you? Would you start a school that could be a, a kind of a prototype of a new form of education? And Rudolf Steiner said, love to. So this is what happened in 1919. So Rudolf Steiner actually hand-selected 12 people to become the first teachers. And he says the, t the, 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 the school will be from first to eighth grade. And, it will, uh, and he chose the, the 12 individuals. And he brought those 12 individuals together. And they looked at each other and they said, Dr. Steiner, why us? And he says, because you are the cream, you're the cream of the, of the generation of your time. And they looked at each other and they laughed and they laughed and they laughed. I said, oh, are you kidding? <laughs> because they were humble people. And he says, no, the prop, you are flexible, you're creative, you have an interest in, in the world. You can become a teacher, you see? You have great capacities. So Rudolf Steiner could perceive spiritually the potential of these, of these 12 individuals. And they were joined by a few others as time went on. So he gave a two-week seminar, a morning course, uh, an afternoon course, and an evening course. And, and after 14 days of training, they opened the school first through eighth grade. Can you imagine? 14 days of training, then we're going to start a school first through eighth grade. Uh, whoa. And so the curriculum, I mean, everything had to be done. It was really a, tremendous, a tremendously creative enterprise, the first Walder School was. And of course, Rudolf Steiner says, it's not going to be perfect. We're going to make lots of mistakes. We're going to have to learn as we go. But the ideals were very clear. I'm just going to read a few of the ideals, and then we'll open it to questions. He said, in education, <coughs> the pupil is the most important thing, not the subject matter. 
the purpose of schooling, other people have said, is not to fill a bucket, it's to help kindle the flame, you see? The child comes with a flame, the child is a fire. You, you know that that is apparent, the child, the child is living in that body and there's a spirit burning there and the child needs to be tended. We need to help that flame come to, come to its fullness. Yeah? So the, in, the, in education, the pupil is the most important thing, not the subject matter. We will use the subject matter at each stage of instruction that will serve to improve the human development of the pupil informing the will, feeling, and thinking, rather than using the school to provide superficial knowledge. Now that's changing our whole attitude about testing, and it's also changing our whole attitude about filling a bucket. The child is not, not, doesn't come to school to, to get filled with abstract ideas. The, child, the, the subject matter is there to help the child develop its capacity to think, to feel, and to act creatively in the world. The teaching of the subject should become an art in the hands of the teachers. The way we treat a subject should enable children to grow into life and to fill their proper place in the world. But it doesn't mean we're training people to do, to become workers in the cigarette factory or to, you know, we're not predetermining what the child will do. The child will find its way. If we help the child develop its capacities, the child will find its way and will become a productive member of life. We don't need to worry about that, you see. Each stage of life brings forth from the depths of human nature the tendency toward particular powers of the soul. If we do not educate these inclinations at the relevant age, they cannot in truth be educated later. They become stunted and render people unable to meet the demands of life connected with the will or the demands of life connected with the feeling or the demands of life connected with our thinking. People cannot rightly take up the position into which life places them if, we don't, if they don't have a proper education. So, so the curriculum emerges out of an understanding of the stages of child development. Between the change of teeth <coughs> and sexual maturity, roughly between the age of 7 to 15, in the real period of education, it is important to recognize the powers of soul and body that children need to develop in order to later fulfill their places in life. So Ruta Steiner was looking creatively at the different stages of childhood and working, he says, the child will tell us what it needs. If we perceive the child's needs, we will know how to work with the child. So the fact that the child remains in imitation, the, he says very briefly, the child up until about the age of nine, the powers of imitation continue. But from seven to 14, uh, from seven to 14, something new is arising. The urge for imitation is very strong coming out of the spiritual world. And it continues strongly in the first seven years and even up to the age of nine. But he says around the age of seven to 14, uh, there is another urge that it is replaced. And that is that the child is looking for teachers that the child will revere. The child wants to be taught by someone who has experience. The child is looking for an author. And so when we use, when Ruta Steiner uses the term authority, we need not to think of dogmatic uh, discipline, but we need to think of authorship. The teacher needs to be a creative person who can author lessons in such a way that they will artistically help me develop my capacities. And Ruta Steiner says, if the child sees in the teacher, the whole, if the teacher represents for the child, and the teacher does, friends, the teacher represents the child's connection with the world. The child leaves the family and enters into a relationship with the teacher. The beauty of all of education is the teacher starts in the first grade and continues to the eighth grade. That means that the teacher knows that child. That teacher has been there in the stages of the child's development from, the, from first and second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth. And by the time the child has completed their eighth grade, if they've been with the same teacher, those, those two individuals have a very, very deep bond. And Buddha Center says the power that the teacher needs and the power that the teacher works with is the power of love. 
It's love for the child. It's reverence for the child. The child will bring love. And he says, if the teacher loves the child, the child automatically loves the teacher. So when Rudolf Steiner would go visit the classrooms, he would, he would you know, can you imagine being a Waldorf teacher and Rudolf Steiner shows up, you know, there you are, and you're in fourth grade and you're teaching and all of a sudden Rudolf Steiner pops in and says, don't, don't mind me, I'll, I'll just sit back here. So, and you're, of course you're sweating bullets because Rudolf Steiner's in the room and what are you going to do now? So, and at some point Rudolf Steiner would stand up and, and he would say yes and he would kind of step into the role of teacher. And he was a master teacher. He knew exactly where the class was. He, he knew the names of every child in the school, hundreds of children. He knew their names, every child, you see. So Rudolf Steiner was deeply connected with these children and deeply connected with the mission of what he was doing. But then, and then finds, he would, so he would do something and of course he would, he would, he was teaching, he was giving a demonstration to the teacher to help quicken their lesson. But then at the end of the, of the lesson, Rudolf Steiner would say to the children, children, do you love your teacher? And their response was, you know, can you imagine, do you love your teachers? Wow. And he says, of course, they enthusiastically, most of them would say yes. And if, but if a few of them didn't say yes, Rudolf Steiner said that was a sign that the teacher isn't loving the children enough, you see. So if the, if the children, if, the, if you love the children, the children will love you. That's the whole thing about being a teacher. The teacher is devoted, friends. I don't know if you are, I'm married to a Walter teacher, and, and I know, believe me, how much, how much Marianne loves her children, how much every teacher loves their children. It's an amazing thing to see. And the intimate relationships that develop between the teacher and the child over those years is absolutely a, a remarkable miracle and, and something to behold. I have the deepest respect for a Waldorf teacher. I'm not a Waldorf teacher, I'm a teacher of adults. But anyway, the love of the child for the, the love of the child for the teacher is a reflection of how much the teacher loves the child.